Thank you for the invitation, both of the invitations, <laughs> last year and this year. And, um, and to Friedrich and uh, Daria, Olga, Maria, for um, the invitation both those times and for organizing such a, an exciting and stimulating conference. Um, I want to preface by saying that uh, I hope this dovetails with the discussion so far in, in so far as I'm trying to actually do perhaps the opposite of what we've largely been striving to achieve so far, which is envision some kind of sasura between the analog past and the digital present. I'm instead trying to map some of the continuities across the arc of photos history. And I take as inspiration Jeffrey Batchin's ectoplasm essay from the late 90s, in which he said we can't think of digital manipulation without thinking of the analog version, and that all photography, given camera lenses, emulsions, etc., is a history of manipulation. So that's what I want to chart now through this talk. If you can't see the image, um, shut up and we can dim the lights. Olga's on it, I think. Okay. Okay, so in 1890, the Jena glass works of Karl Zeiss enhanced its already stellar reputation for cutting edge optical technology by releasing the anastigmatic photographic lens. This valuable innovation achieved a number of advanc advances that had long been sought by both photographers and lens makers alike. For one, it generated a remarkably consistent field of focus across an entire photographic plate. This meant that the edges of the images it made held almost the same clarity as the center, a continuity that other lenses simply could not produce. The anastic mat also generated a deep field of focus at both lower and higher f-stops, that is, at both wider and narrower apertures. Achieving such a profound focal depth had long stymied even the most in, uh, tr intrepid of lens designers. The degree to which photographers welcomed these innovations of focus and exposure can be measured by the English term meant to describe the shortcomings of earlier lenses, aberrations, or Abbildungsfehler in German, a word stressing mistake or failure. As both terms suggest, these faults, uh, visible in viewfinders and prints, were an unwelcome departure from the normal, a detour from the expected. But what exactly was the normal that both photographers and lens makers sought in their images at the time, and who or what defined this pictorial model, which was apparently driving Zeiss's innovation? Upon looking back at the annex thematic lens and its knockoffs as a technology, we might conclude that its deb debut advanced a chapter in optical science that seemed to have progressed automatically since the medium's origins. The reasoning for this is straightforward. Aberrations are bad, and clarity is good. The reasoning for this, uh, 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 correspondingly, technical progress naturally strives to resolve the aberrant in order to produce the ideal. This sort of progress does indeed seem straightforward. But I'd like to attend not just to the technological advancement of this lens, but also to the pictorial ideal that propelled its development. In so doing, I hope to show how this complicated lens arose in part as a cultural product, the development of which was being heavily driven as much by aesthetic aims <coughs> as a positivist will for technological improvement. In fact, the positivist aim and pictorial ideal were inextricably linked, each nourishing the other in a dynamic relationship that led to the development of both in close tandem. In short, I would like to suggest that the consistent focus and varied depth of field that the famous anastic map provided were not in and of themselves the desired goals of these advents, though they were heavily advertised. Instead, they were the visible signals of a pictorial model 
that makers and consumers of photography have been seeking since the medium's public introduction in 1839, and that drove most lenticular improvements since then. This Victoria ideal was a crisp and transparent realism that had remained stubbornly external to the photograph since the time of Daguerre and Talbot. The realism that the anastic map managed to fashion followed on an illusionistic standard that had largely been mediated by painting since the Renaissance and was now, in the late 19th century, apparently possible in photography as well. Ultimately, by opening up the camera and taking a critical look at the lens as a cultural product, I would like to resort our understanding of what identified photography as a distinct medium in the 19th century. That is, I wish to move beyond the final product of the photochemical <coughs> imprint itself and ask the following. Do the lens and its aesthetic imperatives allow us to tell a different story? To begin, it is useful to remember what critic A.D. Coleman observed back in the 1980s, and I quote him here. As an instrument of visual communication, he wrote, the lens is unique in that, for all practical purposes, it is literally as well as metaphorically invisible. Made most commonly of glass or some other transparent substance, it is not in itself seen during the process of image encoding, transmission, and decoding. Rather, it is seen through, end quote. I would now like to look squarely at that thing, not through it. To do so, it is important first to consider the lens itself as a device and to understand what it did between the objects standing before it and the plate that rested behind it. Or perhaps even better, let's look first at what happens without the lens in the basic camera obscura. And so I'll show you a piece of the video for that. Thank you. 
I'm jumping ahead on this image, but think of the video. Notice how the photographer preparing this darkroom describes the camera obscura as black magic, as a natural wonder. This is not unlike how Henry Fox Talbot described his early photographic process, which he called natural magic. As he stressed to Britain's Royal Society in 1839, the with the camera obscura in mind, quote, the most transitory of things, a shadow, the proverbial emblem of all that is fleeting and momentary, may be fettered by the spells of our natural magic and may be fixed forever, end quote. Both the projected image and its fixing were marvelous, a notion to which I'll return later. As we see in the video, and here's just a frame from the video, what one gets through this, through the seemingly mysterious operation of the camera obscura in specific is the upside down projection of the outside world onto the back of a wall. In this case, a finely appointed room in Venice located picturesquely on the Grand Canal. The phenomenon of the projected image is made possible by a pinhole aperture cut in the sealed strip of black plastic sheeting, in this case, placed over the room's windows. One might ask, therefore, why even place a lens in this aperture if you can already get such a crisp image through this simple arrangement alone? The answer is twofold. A small aperture may yield a focused image, but it permits very little light to enter. This is unsuitable for photography, uh, at least for most sorts. A larger hole that lets in more light diffuses and blurs the image, again making the projection unsuitable for the camera. A lens corrects for this infelicitous opposition of clarity and light by gathering a great deal of rays through a large apparatus and then focusing them as a bright, sharp image onto a flat surface. Given these points of departure, what I'd now like to outline may seem rudimentary for any photographers in the room, but I believe that the optics behind the lens's operation are actually quite surprising and warrant review. Objects reflect light by scattering it in innumerable directions. A camera obscura gathers only a small portion of this scattering light as some of its rays pierce the apparatus's aperture. A simple convex lens, such as those on your eyeglasses, can dramatically increase the surface area available to light and focus those gathered beams onto a flat surface. But this benefit introduces a number of problems which result in unmistakably apparent image aberrations. So we're back to that word, aberration. For one, any transparent material such as glass or water will bend light, as one can see by dropping a pencil halfway into a vessel of water. Lens technology is generally designed to compensate for this bending so as to generate a consistent image, that is, to produce the straight lines that accord spaces and objects with the rules of linear perspective. Secondly, the same spherical shape of a lens that enhances surface area also projects light best suited for a similarly spherical surface. Because the photographic plate or negative is flat, one can get spherical aberrations that were considered unsightly and even dizzying, as you can see here where the depicted building's edges fall deeply out of focus. This could be corrected for with a uniquely concave meniscus lens, which was developed 30 years before photography's introduction. But this device could not correct for a third problem. A, tra um, a transparent material will not only bend light, but it will also disperse the wavelengths of light as we see most clearly through a prism. This makes it difficult to focus each color in the optical spectrum at a single point. One moment. The resulting chromatic aberrations in lenses can lead to, if I can, yeah, can lead, okay, um, can lead to blurred and distorted images, such as in these examples where colors separate, focus disperses, and forms distort. This constituted a particularly grave problem. In the early years of photography, 
when the first processes were highly sensitive to blue and far less so to red and brown. The French photographer Gustave Legray famously compensated for this problem by taking separate exposures of the bright sky and green-brown landscape, printing the two separate negatives on plates at the same, uh, on the same piece of albumin paper without a visible scene. But this difficulty can be corrected for, at least in part, with the lens. By using two types of glass, crown and quint, the chromatic aberrations of one can counteract that of the other, making, one moment, for the sort of achromatic doublet that lens maker Charles Chabellier developed for Daguerre in the 1830s. So we're already talking about a very complicated lens in 1839. Now, I review this early photographic lens history in order to emphasize how exceedingly difficult it is to produce the following sort of focus and linear order in a photograph. Putting aside the color of this famous fresco, notice the sharp and consistent focus in and across every plane, from the nearest to the farthest. See too the rigid orthogonal lines that are defined by the sides of the buildings and the polychrome pavement. These were exceedingly difficult to replicate in photographs, yet they defined the illusion of three dimensions that Western audiences had grown accustomed to seeing in pictures. In fact, audiences outside of Asia and Africa had generally come to understand the structure of real space, the objects lying in it, and the viewer's relationship to both space and objects through the rubric of perspective. Illusionism, in other words, heavily determined the experience of lived reality in the West. The photographic lens was largely pressed into the service of this relationship and was thereby made to achieve perspective, a perspectival perfection, lest it destabilize the understanding of space itself. 19th century lenses, growing ever more complicated as they set out to achieve an emulsion what artists had earlier accomplished in paint, were essentially the computers of their day. Much like our electronic gizmos, they absorb a huge amount of data, in this case, transmitted through light. They then crunch and process this raw data to make an easy, legible output that met expectations of pictorial order, correcting for as many aberrations as that of that order as possible. Just as importantly, and also much like the computers of today, very few people knew what actually happened inside these devices, including many of their inventors. Most of the men and women who set about to develop these devices of wonder used trial and error, rather than a thorough understanding of optics. One of the few exceptions to this process of trial and error was the development of the popular Petzval portrait lens which was introduced in 1840, so one year after the introduction of photography. Designed first on paper by the Austrian mathematics professor Josef Petzbad, who was aided by a corps of human calculators from the Empire's armed forces, the plan was handed off to Peter Feuchtlander, who manufactured the lens from the design. A year later, Feuchtlander also designed the camera to which the Petzbad lens could be fitted and Soon thereafter, this new product and its knockoffs flooded the brand new European market for photography. The lens was popular because, unlike cameras outfitted with the Chevalier lens, it exposed its plate to an enormous amount of light. This accelerated the slow daguerreotype process to a speed that made portraiture possible. But the lens broke a raft of rules otherwise applied to photographs both in the years prior to 1840, or that one year, and in the decades that followed. The Petzval produced a severe field curvature and astigmatism, both, which meant that the sharply focused center at its images quickly drifted out of clarity toward the outer reaches of the picture, making for a halo effect, 
Perhaps it is no accident that Petzval was a mathematician seemingly concerned more with numbers than Renaissance rules of perspective. One can see the result uh, in Jan Baptiste Sabatier Blot's famous 1844 portrait of Daguerre, most likely made with a version of this 1844 Hoytlander Pitzball lens. Notice how the sharp focus on Daguerre's face, uh, okay, notice the sharp focus on Daguerre's face, particularly as it picks out the wrinkles near his eyes and the strands of his curious side locks. But the sharpness quickly dissipates over the metal on his lapel before thoroughly falling away over his left hand, his lap, and the arm of his chair. Less noticeable is the irregularity of the field of focus. The sharpness of his face reaches an exuberant, exuberant clarity on the silk tie, and then emerges once more on his veiny right hand, which hangs far below, next to the furniture's blurry upholstery. This spotchy irregularity resulted from the lens's lack of consistency, an aberration that fails to focus light evenly on the plate. These qualities appear far more explicitly in modern Petzval lenses, which, perhaps in a gesture toward our day's fascination with irony, make the lack of clarity utterly clear. In this case, the rings of lower focus are regularized, regularized by a carefully calculated astigmatism around the figure's face, almost making it appear as if the photographer spun the camera as she or he made the exposure. As this contemporary photograph suggests, many photographers and studio clients in the 19th century found this halo effect to be a desirable consequence that seemingly extended the picture frame into the image and offered a dreamlike quality to the portrait. In other words, photographic lens technology did not necessarily have to work toward an elimination of the optical aberrations that failed to accord with traditional perspective. It simply didn't need to do that. As technology historian Lynn White wrote in 1962, quote, a new device merely opens a door. It does not compel one to enter. The acceptance or rejection of an invention or the extent to which its implications are realized if it is accepted depends quite as much upon the conditions of a society and upon the imagination of its leader as upon the nature of the technological item itself, end quote. Many photographers and clients in the mid-19th century indeed let their imagination guide them with the Pitzball lens, which they employed to play up these aberrations for pleasant pictorial effects. The same was purposefully done at the end of the century in the pictorialist movement of photography. Many advocates of this tendency used vari variants of the Dahlmeier lens and portrait lenses to, or the Dahlmeier landscape and portrait lenses to produce similar atmospheric effects along with crazy print procedures that accumulated or accentuated this haziness and announced the presence of the artist's hand. Here, a modern Dalmayer Super 6 renders a highly limited field of focus and a particularly picturesque blurring at the middle and background. As the popularity of these modern and antique lenses reveal, the long and hard-won development that made the size anistic map possible was not inevitable. Instead, it was shaped by a number of factors that made the sort of illusionism generally found in painting the dominant model for photographic representation. Or perhaps better stated, it had been in painting that the rules of illusionistic perspective had most clearly been exercised and had therefore come to be associated with a sort of realism that photography was expected to mimic in the West. One can find this relay in any number of technical manuals meant to help photographers take the most optimal pictures possible using the most appropriate lens available. For instance, the famous 19th century photography polymath, Austrian Josef, or Josef Maria Eder, continually referred to the rules of linear perspective as the standard to be observed by any good lens maker or photographer worthy of the profession. In his exhaustively detailed tome, Photographic Lenses, of 1891, he specifically declared linear perspective to be the measure of a successful photograph. In a section titled, Right and Wrong Perspectival Detail with a Lens, 
He expounds on the often unhappy relationship between focal length and the distance to the photographed subject. Among other examples, he highlights, he highlights the misfire of a child sitting in a chair, taken with a handheld camera sporting a short focal length. The chair, he explains, and I quote, was placed at an angle such that one of the armrests was too close to the camera. The photographer clearly strove to produce the largest dimensions for a subject. The result is fully unusable. The armrest, just as the shoe soles, protrude forward as enormous. The chair seems to be widened, and the other armrest gets lost in the background." End quote. The result is what he terms, quote, a distortion of the picture through an exaggeration of perspective. Of course, what he's pointing to more specifically is an exaggeration of a linear one-point perspective. The system of representation initially worked out in the Renaissance era and therefore, uh, thereafter tucked invisibly into the structure of proper illusionism and even human perception itself. In fact, it is important to step back for a moment and consider the significance of Ada's sort of thinking and what it meant about the hold that illusionistic perspective had on visual perception in the West. A few decades after Ada dispensed his admonishments of that pictorial distortion, German art historian Erwin Panofsky noted that photography had so absorbed the rules of linear perspective that picture consumers were no longer aware that, they, that there actually existed natural modes of visual perception as well. These modes, natural modes, were based on the ever so human experiences of moving eyes, a body in motion, a very narrow diameter of focus surrounded by fuzzy peripheral vision and a retinal image that is projected onto the back of the eye's spherical surface before being heavily processed by the mind. What we naturally perceive in our experience of the world is in essence a curvature of space and lines that Panofsky called psychophysiological space. What illusionistic perspective supplies in contrast is something Panofsky interestingly terms mathematical space. Correspondingly, the subjective or curved perspective of experienced space scarcely, almost not at all, matches the schematic or linear visions of mathematical space worked out in the Renaissance. But as he explains, quote, in a sense, perspective transforms psychological space into mathematical space, end quote, by negating, forgetting, taking no account of, and ignoring the natural experience of perception. Perspective, in essence, plots, charts, and transcribes space through a series of calculations that position objects along rigid trajectories that are not available to natural human vision. Traditionally, painters and other artists realized these calculations through machines, such as the screen depicted in Albrecht Dürer's famous woodcut of a male artist posing his female model subjecting her to the mathematical plotting of three dimensions into two in a way that the human eye could not naturally accomplish on its own. Camera obscuras serve this purpose as well, just as, I'd like to emphasize, lenses do today. It is here that photog photography played a reinforcing role. As Ponowski further observed about the awareness of subjective and psychological space, quote, today, only a very few of us have perceived these curvatures of natural perception, surely in part due to our habituation, further reinforced by looking at photographs, to linear perspectival corrections, a construction that is itself comprehensible only for a quite specific, indeed specifically modern, sense of space." End quote. Now remember, Panofsky's writing this in the mid-1920s. By this reckoning, photographs are now doing the work of habituating Western viewers to linear perspective. As a result, and here I quote Joel Snyder, quote, we accept the photograph as realistic despite its failure to substitute for visual experience, unquote. As I wish to maintain, it was the photographic lens in specific that enabled photographers to serve this end. They enabled the photographs to serve this end. That is, to make linear perspective constructions utterly transparent, more or less invisible. The exceedingly complicated size anistic map 
was spurred on by and served to reinforce this habituation by wiping from view all of the remaining traces of this lenticular operation. Things such as the visible blurring and distorting that were generally dismissed by photographers as unusable and by consumers as unsightly. These operations simply failed to comport with the habituation of linear perspective that the medium had perhaps inadvertently been tasked with providing. At this point, I want to ask a fairly straightforward question. Why? Why is it that photography took on this job of perceptual habituation? And how critical was the lens, indeed, in making this work possible? As for addressing the first part of this question, it may be useful to consider the metaphors through which makers and consumers of photography understood the medium. At photography's origins, before all but a few people had seen a photograph, these analogies were critically important, but hard to lock down. For instance, in his January 1839 announcement of the Guerre's process, Dominique Carago fell into a cascade of comparisons and metaphors aimed at describing the incomparable thing that Daguerre had named the Daguerreotype two years earlier. The image procedure, according to Arago's outlines, left a, quote, perfect impression, end quote, in black, white, and shades of gray. It resembled, quote, a drawing with black pencil, an engraving, or better still, a more exact comparison, a mesotint, or an aquatint, end quote. Remember, this is January 1839. Through the remainder of his discourse, Arago gave up on all these analogies and simply settled on the term drawing. As Stefan Ziegel has shown, Arago's primary task was to put this mysterious innovation into public discourse so that it could be evaluated for purchase by the French state and made available to all for free. But the terms with which Arago chose to identify this new sort of image seemed inexact, inappropriate, or outright obscure. How many members of the Academy of Science, after all, were closely familiar with the mesotent? For his part, Talbert took direct control of the metaphor machine, declaring that his pictures were drawn by the sun itself. As a notice to the reader in his multi-volume publication, The Pencil of Nature explains, and I quote, the plates of the present work are impressed by the agency of light alone without any aid whatsoever from the artist's pencil. They are the sun pictures themselves and not, as some persons have imagined, engravings and imitation." Here, Talbot wanted to assure subscribers to his luxury volumes that the pictures were authentic products of his new process. He correspondingly produced a handy distillation of one of the metaphors that he had been constructing over the previous four years for his new object, a picture made by nature itself, using the pencil of light in the operation of near natural magic. His final name for this procedure was the photographic, I'm sorry, photogenic drawing. Notice that in all these cases, the metaphor used to identify the photograph employs forms of traditional pictorial representation, the engraving, the mesotent, and more commonly, the drawing. These were all forms of art generally structured pictorially by the rules of linear perspective. But, as I earlier explained, light itself does not observe these rules. Instead of lining up with even intensity along rigid orthogonals, light scatters, bends, separates, polarizes, and refracts. Therefore, a picture made by nature itself <coughs> using the pencil of light might look decidedly unlike what audiences expected a picture to be. For instance, Kelly Wilder and Martin Kemp have shown how the scientist John Herschel cultivated an understanding of photography less as a representation of the visible and more as a device of mechanical witness to scientific phenomena, proof of the otherwise transient, quickly fixed for review. The photograph, by this understanding, could be a surrogate for a phenomenon, rather than for an object. Correspondingly, this photograph by John Draper from 1842 does not record objects in illusionistic space, but instead, the points along a spectrum of light where a wavelength failed to imprint 
due to its absorption into the Earth's atmosphere or the Sun's photosphere, a phenomenon. This was not the customary orientation of lens designers. Moreover, lenses produced for other devices also function outside the rules of linear perspective. Microscopes and telescopes generally did not, and still do not, sort objects and visual data across illusionistic space. Instead, the fields in which these given objects appear then and today generally very, uh, generate very different sorts of relations based on what the scientific observer was seeking. Do objects of the micro world occupy space as viewed in the microscope, or do they exist on an impossibly flat plane where the rare overlap alone defies, defines depth? Do stars and galaxies occupy clear space ruled by illusionistic perspective? Or do they rearticulate the very meaning of space deep in the galaxy's farther reaches? These lenses were not designed to reproduce our lived experience, and therefore they need not resort, uh, resort to the conceit of perspective to transform psychological space into mathematical space. Instead, their service to the human eye serves another mandate, or various other sorts of mandates, such as defining form and light emission over extended exposure, revealing patterns or structures, or more essentially, giving data a visual expression that in one way or another may be legible to the human eye. Or what about the photograph that bypasses the lens altogether? Does this too suggest that the photograph did not necessarily need to habituate vision to illusionistic perspective with the critical assist of the lens? One can find these sorts of alternatives to the representation of space, or lack thereof, across photography's history. Among the um, alternate sorts of lenses used for photography were the devices employed by Etienne Jules Marais in his chronophotograph, um, his apparatuses that produced something Martin Jay has called photo unrealism. These images were not meant to serve as an illusion, as illusionistic extension of the viewer's space according to the calculations of one point perspective. But instead, as Mata Brown has explained, they generated empirical visual data recorded directly with the camera, much in the spirit of John Draper. So too could lenses accord with a completely different understanding of illusionistic space made outside the Western world. Yi Gu has recently discussed the first camera designed for and made by a Chinese national, the Qinghua Cylinder Image Camera, invented in 1925 by Kua Jinghua. The pictures made with this device supported the warping of space and the corresponding bending of lines that correspond far more to the psychological space of natural human vision than the rigidity of European Renaissance perspective. A viewer lingers over this photograph much like she or he would before a vast landscape, taking in one section at a time as the eye moves to the left and the right, or up and down, can, can you see this? Visible? No? Yeah? I'm sorry for, for this uh, disco lights really because we are making a video record for people who are not so lucky as you are. So if you can see, they can switch the lights for a moment, switch off, you don't switch it on. Will you? Yes, please. please. <laughs> it's a subtle picture um, because it's, um, it's just so un unlike what we're used to seeing in a photograph. So as this experience of viewing the um, picture, uh, unfolds, the depicted river that runs through most of the picture pulls in from the left and then curls rightward and out again into apparent space, making for a long arc that may or may not define the actual course of this body of water over geographic space. Instead, it seems to mimic the curvature of the retina itself, forever in motion and forever registering new, often unfocused visual data. The lens and cylinder device inside the Qinghua took pictures not in accordance with Western one-point perspective, but instead by the pictorial norms of traditional Chinese painting. As Wu explains, quote, Quan's invention epitomizes the continuous negotiation between monocular vision, 
based on the Euclidean geometry that underwrote the conception of photography, and binocular vision, which does not isolate vision from other bodily movements." Quote. As this negotiation suggests, the concept of photography in the West increasingly hooked its wagon to the powerful locomotive of linear perspective, such that any image cut loose from this train might no longer seem to be a photograph at all. I want to stress that this operation in the West generally worked transparently, almost undetectably, as the standard metaphors used to identify photography took stronger and stronger hold. The aim of the Victorious movement was in part to pull the medium away from this maturing conception and instead produce images defined by natural, i.e. subjective, human perception, or by loosely rendered painting. In addition to procedures such as gum printing and negative scratching, a series of alternative lenses, as noted earlier, famously produced by the Dunmire firm, made this sort of non-traditional photography possible. So it's an alternative kind of lens. Meanwhile, the developers and manufacturers of popular lenses continued hammering away at conceptions of photography based on precision, efficiency, and speed all with an eye to the clean, sharp, illusionistic perspective that these machines were supposed to fashion. A French retailer of the Goethe and Astigmat emphasizes just these terms in an advertising text as a high jumper, clearly caught mid-flight by this fast device placed before a sensitive plate. Another promotion by the same merchant highlights a cross-section of the lens apparatus itself making available the crystal equivalents to today's electronic circuits, meant to crunch the data coming in as light. Other advertisers perform different promotion, permutations of logic. These advertising, these promotions are always fun. Comparing the lens outfitted camera with the action it could smoothly catch, or with the open and closed iris of a cat suggesting that the lens could work as efficiently as a cat's eye at both high and low light levels. These ultimately articulated the discourse of Panofsky's mathematical space. A language made explicit in his, in his book, um, Photographic Lenses, which sported exhaustive tables measuring optical focal length against appropriate distance in order to assure correct perspective. I'm suggesting this is the expression of mathematical space in numbers. We can understand this table and the many others like it in Ido's book as a numerical expression of what happens when space is plotted precisely through calculations that provide it with the shape that illusionistic perspective demands. Or in contemporary terms, this chart is the later 19th century equivalent of a bitmap, quote, a representation in which each item corresponds to one or more bits of information, especially, but not necessarily, the information used to control the display of a computer screen." End quote. I pulled that from Wikipedia. My main point is that the camera lens, along with other photographic technologies such as shutters, emulsions, and filters, all advanced along the lines of crisp, sharp, one-point linear perspective with very few exceptions. These advances and the primary metaphors used to identify photography fed on each other um, such that only a photo that worked pictorially along these lines could be fully understood as a photo at all. But this urgently required the utter transparency of the photographic apparatus, which the ever-improving lens was increasingly able to provide. Until now, I've not even mentioned the lens of the enlarger which slipped into the photographic process without most viewers even noticing the difference. Photographer Justine Varga recently outed the enlarger lens as a phantom, phantom presence in our photographic culture, highlighting it in this negative that, that takes in the entire device and the light it mediates. Back in the 19th century, as this realism unfolded, the metaphor of the more present camera lens as an eye began to take hold making it absolutely urgent that the lens's role in vision be no more apparent than that of the human eye itself, which, paradox paradoxically, the lens was beginning to overwhelm. In the early days of photo, 
When the metaphors for the medium were first taking shape, there was more room for the photograph, scientific rendering data, and even the images imprinted by the Pittsball lens to become the standard for the medium. But the metaphor of the lens as an eye proved far too alluring, and the default of mathematical space all but inevitable. Thank you. Tons of questions. <laughs> okay, it starts there. See, I don't even. Thank you very much for this um, very profound talk and very focused talk. But uh, I had a question uh, about another type of uh, photographic, about another, excuse me, about another type of vision that developed in the 19th century and that undermined the concept of the camera obscura. I'm talking of the stereoscope. Yeah. And uh, actually, what I have in mind is Jonathan Creary with his uh, famous uh, book, Techniques of the Observer. And uh, your uh, dichotomy, if I may put it that way, was uh, was one between, um, let's say, the objective gaze, uh, uh, as it is exemplified in the lens, and what you call lived perspective, also psychological space, and so on. But wouldn't you also think of introducing another dichotomy, which may be even more graphic in certain ways, uh, within the domain of uh, technology? That is to say, between the photographic lens and the stereoscope, which undermines monocular vision, the concept of perspective, uh, and the very notion of representation, which is uh, really awesome, <laughs> in my opinion. Thanks. Thank you. Well, um, I, I, would, I would emphasize that the stereoscope actually affirms perspective. Because although it does do uh, great work to reproduce the experience of three dimensions, it nonetheless actually played a big role in, in making perspective really good and sharp and capturing movement in photography of the uh, like 1860s uh, because the short focal length captured movement. And the, the, fo the focus was much more easy to, uh, to, to fashion than in the um, single lenses that had much vari um, many more variations of focal length. So, I, I see your point that, and this is what I'm inferring, um, that the stereoscope does some work to recreate the experience of subjective <coughs> perspective, the experience of space by the human uh, eye. But if you put your eye, when you put your eye to those two lenses, you get uh, a view of space that is so regimented yeah. by perspective. But I think it only reaffirms exactly what the photographs were otherwise doing with standard lenses. But that would be something good to talk out. So thank you for that question. Thank you very much uh, for this paper. And uh, actually, uh, you um, showed a photograph of uh, Kian Yunghua um, as an example which uh, transgresses in certain sense this uh, um, monocular vision, uh, which uh, opens uh, the perspective uh, of the Renaissance to towards something else, and you compare it to uh, Japanese painting. Uh, and in this, I think you are quite right, but uh, actually, uh, this reminded me uh, Norman Price's text uh, on the question of visual regimes in the Occident and in the Orient, and he contrasts actually the uh, yeah, Renaissance perspective. Uh, with the concept of sunyata, sunyata, which is uh, blankness, emptiness, um, and uh, he shows that uh, uh, representations uh, which were made or are made in this related to this uh, concept um, are representations which dissolve the frame or outlines and which create a kind of openness and a multi perspective. And now I found it interesting that actually that's precisely one or the example that you showed uh, that transgresses uh, monocular uh, perspective or vision 
uh, this from Chinese culture and this may Chinese. 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 Ah, it was Chinese. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I thought it was Japanese. So, but uh, okay. Uh, then I'm not sure the same concept. Uh, also, it was Chinese culture, even though there were many uh, cultural uh, relationships between them. But uh, actually, it's uh, uh, another culture, another visual regime uh, that uh, might, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, be on the uh, base of this uh, new uh, way of seeing or representing. May I add a question to that? Could you, could you say something about the lens the photographer, the Chinese photographer, uh, using? Yeah, it's, so it's, um, it's called a flip lens. I think that's the name for it. Uh, when you press the shutter button, the lens actually does that. And that's how it catches this panorama. But I think I... I, think I I, I understand what you're saying is it's nonetheless a machine that's made to codify through modern technologies a form of vision, nonetheless. And, and let me add with what Helen asked me, um, it, it is, um, I quoted from Yi Wu who compares binocular Western vision to binocular Chinese vision, which actually does suggest the stereoscope. But the consequence of the image is uh, very different than what we would expect uh, to be looking at through a, uh, a stereoscope. Mm -hmm. But do, do I understand your question correctly in terms of what it was that you're seeing as the relationship between the machine and the image that was then produced for the King Hua cameras? Well, perhaps more that uh, in this case it wouldn't be the lens that uh, is responsible for the result of the image, but it's more. Uh, it's more the um, visual, the different visual regimes which use lenses in a different way. That's the point. <coughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. So I think we're thinking the same thing. It's still, it's still a machine, but producing different kinds of vision, depending on like what kind of vision to which the majority of the audience was situated. And this is a kind of uh, E. She goes by Evie. She writes when she discusses it that that China was in the throes of a kind of nationalism. And so there was an effort to reconstitute what might be thought of as a Chinese way of seeing, and the camera could be understood as an expression of that. Um, apparently, it was marketed by Kodak in China, which makes it an all, all the more curious phenomenon. I'm wondering if you could address the relationship of the lens to the rectangle. In other words, photography, like television, at one point was an oval. And it was more, in my opinion, holistic, lyrical, in a sense, natural. The rectangle, looking at the screen behind you, is repetitive, it's boring, it's artificial, it is inhuman. So how did we get from what you're describing, this sort of default of the linear, supposedly substituting for something like human vision when none of us see in rectangles. Yeah, yeah. and ad added to that is the fact that it was incredibly difficult to uh, have lenses accord with a rectangular or square plate because that involved a lot of acrobatics with the light rays processed through a lens. So not only is it unnatural, but it was a lot of work to reproduce, I mean to, to do. So uh, I don't actually know the answer to that question. I can only riff and guess that one of the um, standard forms of representation people had accommodated themselves to was not just linear perspective, but also rectilinear platforms on which images were conveyed. Uh, there were, of course, um, oval uh, platforms. I'm using that word anachronistically, of course, but um, the, some of the early um, machines that were pre-photographic produced um, optical or elliptical images. So those seem more aligned with human perception, but um, they're relatively rare. So I think it, it was just the way people were accustomed to consuming a picture. It had to be square or rectangular. But there might be other more profound ways of describing this, but that's a really great point. So um, it's what was done with опубликованная о общей теории перспективы, и там говорится о перспективной перспективе. Вы вот этот вопрос совсем не коснулись, 
перспективные перспективы, восприятие человеческого разума перспективы. У него точно описана математическая модель этого восприятия и каким образом это соотносится с линейной перспективой, о которой вы сейчас говорите. A mathematician named Boris Rutenbach came up with a theory of perceptive perspective. It's mathematically has been mathematically calculated, yet you never really spoke about that. What do you what do you think about it and how does it correspond to the linear perspective that you've been talking about in such great detail? Thank you. What's the name of the person who wrote about it? But Boris Rushenbach. Rushenbach. Rauschenbach. Um, I'm not aware of his writing, so I would like to be aware of it. So it, it's hard for me to uh, to explain the relevance of his of his writing to what I'm talking about now. But it sounds really interesting. Um, pers perceptive perspective. Yeah. I so I all I can say is I need to read that. I'm trying to absorb a ton of literature on perspective, in part to learn. Um, what this thing is, but also as historical documents, how people understood perspective at any one time. So thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much. But I would like to ask him about the role of reproduction, because uh, reproduction, um, a photograph is not just an um, image which is done with a lens, but it's a massive, mass, massively produced image. And when you look at a photograph, not for, I don't know, a minute or even 30 seconds, but when you look at it at a flip of a second, and, uh, so the circulation of images, which is also a very important part of the photographic apparatus, uh, would change uh, the characteristics of uh, the linear perspective and working of the lens, and whether it's important to you or not. Thank you. Uh, so, are you talking about other parts of the camera apparatus? Like uh, no, no, no. I'm, I mean, not the uh, camera itself, but the way uh, images are reproduced and, and used by uh, a, a reader or a viewer, uh, like um, uh, postcards which are flipped through, or a magazine which also not look at, I and mean, not uh, every picture is not looked in detail, but really just really flipped through and you look at this image, really a, a, a portion of a second with a corner of an eye and not a well arranged sort of attention, which is presupposed by a linear perspective. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what I would say then in response to that is that um, any one photograph is generally not going to be isolated on a white wall in a gallery, soliciting that kind of sustained attention to the single image within that frame. But instead, most images, I mean, now of course they're consumed on screens, but you reference the magazine, which is another thing I'm working on uh, a lot. And uh, I, I see your point that maybe perspective is only one factor in how one consumes this, because I would add, from what I've been looking at, the other factors are those that are heavily designed, and that is photography in sequence, graphic design, and text. Those all combine to an amalgam that guides the consumption of a photograph as part of a larger amalgam. And so in that case, perspective plays a role in any one individual photograph, but it's only one of many factors that are directing one's consumption of the material more broadly. So that I definitely acknowledge. And if I really want to emphasize, especially after what we heard this morning, that um, your consumption of a photograph is determined by so many different factors, especially the era, I mean, the one I'm thinking of more specifically is the era of the magazine. Um, <laughs> I, love, I love how tightly this is oriented, our, our kind of perception of the orthodoxy that developed around perception is, is oriented around the lens. And I wonder if you're writing in parallel or researching in parallel at all the development of, of I mean, kind of the, the development of orthodoxies around the paper yeah. <clears throat> and the rectangle um, that that um, you know kind of commercially produced films 
and papers and, uh, and larger stands um, kind of end up created, and how those rectangles might um, add to the metaphor of the eye and the metaphor of the window. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I don't know if that's later in the 20th century, but it definitely ends up affecting the Earlier yeah. too. So um, this I can contextualize this. So I, I, I have now 15 months to finish two books. <laughs> then I'm moving on to this. So the lens is only one chapter. It's going to be a book on the cultural production of lens technologies. And as I envision the chapter so far, it's lenses, paper, emulsions, filters, and shutters. So I may come up with more, but I don't want to get too crazy because then it can go forever to write. But it's mostly focused on the 19th century when these things were taking their shape. And I'm not going to spend too much time outside the West, but instead in the countries where a lot of these technologies were most rapidly developed. So that would be Austria, Germany, France, the UK, and North America. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, because my, you know, my experience of, of, the, of the window, uh, you know, of the perfect window, <coughs> is obviously inherited from paintings, pictorial tradition, yeah. as you suggested with respect to the, the, the lens. Um, but, uh, but, you know, there's the, the very idea of projecting light even through a lens that's perfect, if you're not projecting on a flat surface, it's not going to come out with that kind of uh, perfect edge. And um, there are photographers now who think about that as we're kind of loosening from a modernist 20th century. But, Certainly, up until the turn of the millennium, there are people who they didn't want you to be able to see that the print was in the room. You know, it was supposed to be a perfect window. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so, so that the platform, the, the paper would disappear. Yeah, you would just yeah. see the image. Yeah, I mean, there are people maybe like Jeff Wall who wanted to assert it as an object, but for the most part, uh, Greg Kurtzen, even even when when stuff became very constructed, it was it was invisible. Yeah. Right. Okay. So window, I am not, yeah. Ah, I see what you're saying. Well, then window perspective as well, because that's often the metaphor used in the Renaissance for perspective, like creating something that yeah. makes the experience of viewing through a window. But um, I think a good number of papers, using Gatwise and that like human papers, are supposed to be super smooth and clear and transparent and very different from pictorialist operations okay. like gum printing and so forth, where it really is about the object. And that difference, I think, helps define the rule that most people made for photos. But then, of course, there are vernacular traditions where people paint on photographs, like Jeff Batchen has written, to the point where the photograph, the original work, disappears, and you just have to paint it. Um, that's another kind of outlier. Maybe not even an outlier. <laughs> that would be a question. <laughs> Thank you very much for a really fascinating talk. I'm sure you can't wait to read the book, both of them. Um, oh, no, this is after those two. <laughs> Say again? This is after those two. After? Oh, I see. Well, I'm going to read the book. I'm going to read what comes after. Um, I've got two questions, but they, they relate pretty much to things you already addressed. I'm probably mainly asking for a little bit of uh, elaboration if, if you've got some more information. Um, I'm particularly interested if you know more about the forces, as it were, that operated behind the scenes that you like to push this connection between the eye and the lens. Uh, I think you definitely addressed it, of course, throughout the talk, but I'm wondering if you can perhaps help us uh, group them uh, into kind of professions or type of uh, interests. Um, and the second question is about the uh, uh, return of the cell lens, uh, mainly through the long graphic society that uh, reproduces all this uh, so-called old technology. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about um, what it may tell us about our understanding of photographic vision in the 21st century, when such so-called old technology comes back and completely undermines, of course, the way in which we've uh, uh, understood photography to date, and all of a sudden this is a new trend, if you like. Hmm. Um, so as for the first, I, I, that's one of the things I really, like the relationship between the eye and the lens, I want to explore a lot more. And it seems that the uh, people who were working on lenses were often working on eyeglasses as well. Uh, and Friedrich very nicely sent me this amazing book on the history of photographic lenses written by an important researcher, a technician at Leitz. And, um, no, Zeiss, at Zeiss. And um, that, that, is, it's super dry. <laughs> it's incredible. 
So it's really a slog to get through this material, but, it, it, but that, meta, that equation is constantly, it's always present. I don't, quite, I don't quite know when it arises or how, but um, I would like to find out. But um, I'm just guessing for now it's in part because the technology is used for both eyeglasses and the lens. Um, and then there may be other obvious relationships between the lens and the eye that I just haven't mapped quite yet. And your other question regarding um, uh, the, the return of the past events in, in our time. And if it undermines our current understandings of photography. I'm, I'm wondering whether we can learn something about the way in which we uh, connect with photography in the 21st century, considering the fact that this lens uh, uh, kind of uh, made a comeback, as it were. The, the pet spot lens. The pet spot lens, yes. Um, and it, 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 well, maybe I'm exaggerating, but let's say amongst uh, some circles, it definitely becomes a trend to use it and to actually uh, manipulate or exploit this uh, inaccuracy of the yeah. vision that the lens offers. So I'm wondering whether we can learn something from that about photography in the 21st century, considering many of the papers we already had today, uh, many of which I assume emphasize the way in which photography is being standardized on this yeah. and all imagined photographs to do more or less the same thing. Um, of course, there was some exception, I'm exaggerating. Uh, so I'm wondering whether now when we have this old technology coming back and, and it becomes quite a, quite a trend way of uh, yeah. depicting the world, whether it can tell us something about our relationship with photography in the 21st century. I, I think it can. Um, I, I haven't taken on that challenge, but Lyle Rexer wrote this interesting book about 10 years ago called The New Antiquarians, in which he suggested, among other things, that the faults with this sort of early photography or the exaggeration, for example, in that new Petzval lens of imperfections around the um, periphery of the image are a, an embrace of imperfection, mm -hmm. of aberrations, which now have utterly disappeared from digital photography. And, but maybe people who teach photo students, like Farah and Fred, maybe you could expand on why it would be that some of your students would want to embrace these old collodion procedures or uh, Petzla lenses or Dalmaya lenses, because it would be interesting to see what they use as a reason. They're not. Okay. I don't know about other people's experience, but many of my students are embracing aberration. Oh, are. Not necessarily through lenses, though. They want to handle their prints, they want to expose. Oh, so they want the object. They want the object back because that provides some of the kind of first person perspective that I think authenticity yeah. is, is. I know we're after with authenticity. But, um, <laughs> um, but they also, I think, when they turn to digital photography, even when they are interested in handled physical print, they. Um, they are interested in working on perception and perspective, um, not necessarily through, again, a change of lens, but um, like Noriko Furanishi, for example, is someone who extends the perspective into a different, um, kind of more traditional <coughs> Japanese shape, not through a trick lens, yeah. but through um, her process, other stuff. So, yeah, aberration, for sure. Interesting, that would be the, the um, coda for the book, kind <laughs> <laughs> discussion. So I, I know through conversation with you, we're both interested in this issue of like thinking through the apparatus and the types of images that apparatuses produce. I'm, I'm curious about the, the final set of images that we have here. Are you dealing with the, the range finder or the viewfinder? Because it actually really doesn't fit with the 19th century lenses. Uh, and it's, and uh, these images to me, or quite a few of them, but the Leica images, it's a different, it's actually a return to trying to imagine the camera as capturing human vision, and yeah. the camera as like what the human eye sees in a way that a lot of the 19th century cameras didn't function. Yeah, yeah, th th this, well here, I, that would suggest that the uh, metaphor of the lens as an eye is actually newer than what I'm looking at in the 19th century. And one of the ones I would point, and I give credit to a student of mine, Caitlin Moore, who assembled this for me. She's going to be a Lester soon. <laughs> but um, this one especially is particularly curious because yeah. he's looking through a lens. And the lens so amplifies, increases the 
size of his eye and the uh, area around the eye, that it itself is like an aberration. It, it shows the denaturalizing effect of the lens rather than an eye. Unfortunately, the time machine stopped working.